Let me welcome Peter back to talk to some ministers about the impact of COVID and most of all about resilience. And we do have Mr. Resilience as one of the ministers here, my old friend Edmund. So take it away, Peter. Well, I've uh, never heard Edmund described as Mr. Resilience before, so why don't I introduce our, our panel right now, the Honorable Minister of Tourism of Jamaica, Mr. Edmund Bartlett. The Secretary of State for Tourism of France, His Excellency Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne. Oh, go ahead. Of course, Fernando Valdez. The the Secretary of Tourism. And then joining us virtually, I hope, we have uh, Gada Shalabi, the Vice Minister of Tourism and, and Antiquities for the, for the Republic of Egypt. There she is on the left. And on the right, Sophia Zakaraki, the Deputy Minister of Tourism for Greece. So a lot of things to get to today, everybody. Um, and while I'm standing here, the rules, I think, are changing again. Uh, the last time I saw Fernando, the rules changed while we were on the stage. That's when the European Union announced that vaccinated Americans could come. Yeah. Then, just a few weeks later, they announced, hey, maybe we'll reinstate the rules. So everybody here has a different rule. Everybody over there has a different rule. There are 196 countries out there sure. with different rules. Um, it's, it's tough to keep up from a consumer angle. It's tough to keep up from a governmental angle. And of course, from pub private public partnership angle, it's especially tough to keep up. Add that to the mix of what we would call red zones, or in the US, State Department advisories. Right now, there are State Department advisories level four that say those three nasty words, do not travel, that cover 80% of the globe. It's crazy. In fact, you're in there. Uh, I think you're in there. Everybody's in there. Uh, Antarctica is in there. Anybody see any glowing penguins? So the point is, where do we go in terms of effectively communicating what we're doing from a rulemaking procedure? How do we tell people what the real truth is? How do we figure out what's important? The vaccination levels at the destination or the vaccination levels of the people who want to go to that destination and how people can re behave responsibly? Because the purpose of our session today, of course, just like the last session, is talking about what? Not just the environmental aspects of sustainability, but the financial aspects of sustainability, the social aspects. And so I'm going to throw it over to Edmund first, because you guys are one of the first to try to figure out a way out and way in, if you will, for people who want to travel. And then, of course, you still want to do that within the sphere of sustainability. Edmund? Uh, thank you. There's a microphone right there, Edmund. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, firstly, I think the essence of this very difficult period of, of management for us in tourism is, is perhaps leadership and, and I think social capital. Uh, the essence of leadership here takes us in the realm of trying to understand truly what are the un underpinning factors that are now driving this uh, pandemic, first of all, the recovery. What it is that we need to do, so difficult, because the process of doing so is highly iterative as, as we seek to find best practices and uh, in linear programming jargon, the best fit line. What are the combination of action that constitutes this? We started early in Jamaica because we recognized that tourism is highly susceptible to disruptions. Uh, and we needed to establish not just institutional framework to respond to it, but to build capacity among our people to understand it and to respond. So we established the Global Tourism Resilience and Crisis Management Center at the University of the West Indies there to begin that whole process of getting people to understand what it is uh, that you will face. How do you bounce back? How do you mitigate? How do you manage? How do you recover? How do you recover quickly? and thrive afterwards. So the essence of all of what we did was that. So we set up a recovery team shortly after, a crisis management team. So leadership for us began with crisis management. I got it. 
And then, of course, you have so many economies that are not just tourism-based, but tourism-driven. And I go to, to, of course, our friend in Cairo, uh, <laughs> Vice Minister Shalabi. I mean, when you think about it, you can do a direct correlation. You can connect the dots between tourism and putting food on the table for the people who live there. So how are you bouncing back right now in the wake of the world still being uncertain about whether they can even come to your country? Well, uh, we faced as, as tourism industry has been a resilient industry in Egypt. Uh, throughout the years, we faced so many uh, crises, and uh, it's been quite a successful story each time. And this time as well, uh, we've learned every day. We've learned, and we've learned from other countries. We've learned from other experiences, and uh, structured approach, be it from the uh, uh, government itself and the private sector and the people and the, the international organizations. This correlation was quite important to approach um, a unified and also structured approach. It came from the government itself, from the senior leadership, uh, the belief and the, the, the need that this industry would come back uh, as quick as possible and also as safe as possible as well. We were not quite, uh, uh, you know, taking it uh, quite fast, but we've studied uh, the odds, we've put our strategy and also applying the strategy of um, uh, procedures, of uh, legislations. Not only that, but also following it up, um, um, making sure that um, establishments, if they fall back, we would bring them back on track, uh, following up on the procedures and the health and safety uh, uh, requirements was a mandatory by everyone. And as you said, that the bringing food on the table, because this industry in Egypt has over 1 million workers and over 10 millions of co-workers within the same, uh, uh, trying to work within the, the framework of, of tourism. Uh, so buying into what we wanted to do, uh, believing in the procedures that we, uh, we were implementing, came from staff in themselves, applying the health and safety procedures on their themselves and also on travelers was the key factor uh, of the destination being uh, believed in by travelers, by which from the first day that we resumed tourism, which uh, have led us into a sustainable development of inbound travelers coming into our destinations. One of the first countries to open in Europe was Greece. They did it almost immediately, and I now am joined by, uh, by Deputy Minister Zakharaki. Uh, what gave you the confidence to move that quickly, to know that you could do it sustainably on a health issue, not to mention an environmental issue? Well, thanks, first of all, for the, for the question, and, uh, and again for the opportunity to talk again to an audience in, in Portugal. I was in Portugal last week, and now I'm very pleased and honored to be at the Vora Forum. Thank you again, the World for Travel, because we are given the opportunity also to recap on what has happened and also definitely reassess what the immediate action plans should be on the three pillars of sustainability, as you very simply put it during uh, the question before. So let me start by saying that uh, I think that this year, 2021, this tourist season has been a year that resilience was proved. As the minister uh, just, just mentioned, there is the resilience of tourism. It's people, because we're talking about the heart of the effort, and the heart of the effort are those 411,000 people who work or used to work around tourism here in Greece in more than 10,000 hotels and, of course, all the economy around and among it. So, um, answering your question, for us it was a difficult, a difficult balance between freedom, safety, among freedom, safety, and of course the ability to travel. But we, we had a very important asset, and that was the experience of 2020. And let me point out that I was particularly honored as a country to receive and as a ministry to receive the award of the country that started in the safest way, started tourism last year. Our Prime Minister uh, Mitsotakis, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, introduced the idea of a digital uh, certificate that would allow us uh, to align on the measures that would apply to every country. Did this work? 
we, we have to we have to think about that and definitely enable travelers to go again. And as uh, it was mentioned before, it was of course also the scientists. We put together an emergency crisis committee that worked on every ministry on a leader manner and really dealt with uh, with issues. So we started early. We communicated this decision early enough to all the major players. We had renewed protocol, uh, safety protocols, and of course, with the very valuable health also of the UNWTO, we were able to communicate the, me the, the measures that we took. And we saw that a lot of countries really responded to this message. A lot of people from around, from around Europe visited our country this year. We had in August, the lowest, let's say, uh, decline of commercial flights. Uh, Greece championed the 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 the, 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 the coming again, let's say, the, the the arrival of the commercial flights again. And we had a lot of visitors from the United States too. Uh, we communicated the message and we opened the borders to the United States early enough. So I think that these are some of the first things that we did: communicating early, renewing our safety protocols and definitely having the European civic, uh, um, digital certificate in place. Uh, these were three of, of the driving forces. And of course, the vaccination, which is progressing also in Greece. It's about 65% of the general population that has now been vaccinated. And of course, our campaigns that are recurring in order to, uh, to help more people be convinced and be, go and get vaccinated. Thank you. The minister just said something interesting about a delicate balance in this brave new world and about trying to get documentation. I think we'll all agree that there's still, there's still not a centralized set of standards that's easily verifiable, easily readable, uh, updatable, not forgeable. Uh, but I do understand, Mr. Secretary, that you have a document now in France, uh, in the EU, for, for, for COVID and vaccination. Uh, how do I get one? Bien, je vais m'adresser en français à l'auditoire parce que le ministre du Tourisme en France est également chargé de la francophonie. Donc, il défend la langue française et le multilinguisme. Voilà. Alors, I have no idea what he said. Je, je, je dis parce que maintenant, ça y est, Peter est équipé. Le ministre du Tourisme en France s'occupe aussi de la francophonie et de la langue française. Donc, il parle en français. Bien, en tous les cas, euh, grand bonheur d'être ici euh, avec, euh, avec tout le monde pour partager, croiser les regards et partager les expériences. Le pass sanitaire, nous l'avons mis en France en place au mois de juillet et en fait, ça a été la clé pour sauver l'été. Parce que grâce au pass sanitaire, on a pu garder ouverts les restaurants, on a pu garder ouverts eh bien, les parcs d'attractions, on a pu garder ouverts toutes les activités. Pour écouter en anglais, c'est un bouton 1 pour l'anglais. Je précise pour l'assistance. Bouton 2, c'est le français. Bouton 3, c'est le portugais. 10 ans chez Darty. Alors, euh, je disais, Peter, que le pass sanitaire en France, c'est ce qui a permis de sauver l'été parce que nous avons pu garder ouvert les activités. Le pass sanitaire, ce n'est pas un passeport vaccinal parce que le pass sanitaire, c'est soit vous êtes vacciné de doses, soit vous faites un test PCR ou antigénique qui est négatif. Et donc, on est sûr que vous ne mettez pas en danger les autres dans vos activités sociales. Both doses of the vaccine or uh, that uh, uh, you have you had a negative test. And so uh, it, it is not just being vaccinated. It's something that allows you to circulate. And now we, had, we have millions of vaccines, millions of jabs administered by... Uh, uh, by uh, the Americans and Canadians, and uh, now we have adopted these passports so that uh, they could leave, fully live the experience of tourism. And this is tourism. This experience uh, uh, should not be limited uh, uh, by the existence or, or, or non-existence of a health passport, but I would like to say to my Portuguese and French colleagues that uh, in, uh, 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 in Europe, uh, we are able to implement uh, uh, in the short term 
the conditions for circulation in the European space uh, with the implementation of these QR codes. Uh, Greece was uh, launched uh, uh, I mean, launch this passport, uh, the vaccination passport very early on, and we then uh, reached the co uh, common conclusion. Many million people uh, were then able to, to circulate within Europe. Many French people spent their holidays in Greece and uh, for port to Portugal, etc. So, uh, uh, we cannot visit the United States or Australia, it's difficult to visit Brazil. So, it was difficult, but we were able to coordinate things uh, uh, within Europe. Well, that brings up the, poss the possibility or the subject of reciprocity. As we're standing here right now, I was able to come here, but you can't come to the United States. What's holding that up? Is it technology? Is it politics? I guess that's a rhetorical question. Um, but is it also public health? Well, I think it is each one of them. Um, the hey, level pick, pick one. Well, health, or, uh, we've been seeing that the ones who, uh, who are been driving all these crises uh, mainly are the health authorities. So at the end, the decisions has been taken uh, basically on, on health issues. We've been trying to push uh, from our side in governments, in the sector, to try to give some flexibility, to, to bring them protocols. My colleague from Greece talked about protocols. I think this is a key matter all over the world. We have to come together to the same protocols on not only how to make tourism safe, but how to make uh, travel safe. But at the end, it's not only health, it's about politics. I mean, each one of us has been uh, trying to, to, or struggling with the pandemic at the national level. And you guys also at the media, you give different sides of the, of the equation. So at the end, you have to, to try to bring an equilibrium between not closing down and not breaking the industry, but at the same at the same time, not putting risk or not assuming a risk who is not bearable from the point of view of, of public health. We've been trying from the European side, and, and my colleagues, they know him uh, as well as I do, that we've been trying to, to establish a dialogue with the US and other countries uh, to try to establish this reciprocity. Uh, and you, you mentioned it at the beginning of, of this panel. I mean, if we... Uh, try to put in place different uh, parameters, different variables, not only accumulated incidents, but let's, let's work on uh, vaccination, let's work on how is uh, going to impact the, the pandemic on, on our health system. I think we can reach an agreement between all of us uh, and try to put in place all the industry, not only uh, hotels, not only restaurants who have worked in this summer thanks to our nationals. We ha I, I think we, we all agree our, our industry is not only about uh, recovery but is about numbers and the numbers we are taking, at least the countries that we, we have the population that, that can help us in this matter, basically have, we've, we've done well this summer because our nationals, we need to recover international mobility. It's we domestic travel. Domestic oui. travel for you too. Bien sûr. Euh, heureusement qu'il y a eu ce socle domestique. Euh, pour vous donner un ordre d'idée, 85 à 90 des Français qui sont partis en vacances ont fait le choix de redécouvrir. That we had this domestic. It's a good thing that we had these domestic opportunities. Uh, so this is a French summer. This is a, a red, white, and blue summer. Uh, I call it because we will have uh, the presidency of the European Union n next, and in, during our presidency, we'd like to discuss and work on uh, the Europeans' right to travel. This represents 75% of the number of international travelers. So. Uh, uh, 
This is absolutely vital for economic recovery in Europe. Talked about when the European Union announced the possibility of reinstating the restrictions, one of the first countries to say we're not reinstating anything, we're still open, was Portugal. Why? You know. No, I no problem at all. My pleasure to, to contribute to the discussion. First of all, hello everyone. My pleasure to have you here in Portugal. Um, yeah, we were the first ones. As I said before, we had the presidency at the European Council, so we thought that it would be a good idea to open up and to give the example. So pretty, pretty much that's what we did. Of course, we had the Greeks opening up the idea of the passports, and thanks to the Greeks, we tried to materialize that, to put it in a tangible way. We did it in six months. It was a record, you know, ultra record uh, seen in the EU. And for Unfortunately, um, now we have to guarantee that we are not talking only on European level, but also international level. And you mentioned US, we have Canada, we have Brazil, all that. We need this long haul, not only for TAP, by the way, but to all of us, <laughs> we need that. Because we are entering the off-peak season for, for Europe, so we need those, 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 pe those, those guys that are coming from US and other countries. Thank you, Rita. Uh, let me just ask a question to all of our panelists. Have we gotten to the point now where we're not looking at this as eradicating a disease, but managing it? Sure, sure. I think uh, it's not about, and if I may, this, ha this also has to do with not only recovery, but with transformation. We do need to think about how to transform, how to improve our sector, how to improve uh, tourism. At least in Spain, COVID, it's been the biggest crisis on, on tourism. Never be before we face uh, a challenge such as the, the COVID-19 that closes down, that closes our, one of our main industries. So it is, it, is about managing, um, it is about managing travel, it is about managing safety, but it's, it is also about improving and transforming our, our sector. I think we all, We've been doing our homework. This stop, this reset has given us the chance to think about sustainability, how to make tourism more sustainable, more digital. I think contactless technologies has helped a lot and a COVID certificate is one of the examples that we, we think about. So we, we really need to put this in place to help us uh, restoring the numbers. Again, the numbers are key uh, to our future, but on a different way. I think we, we need to manage. We can stop, we cannot stop, we cannot put in place again more restrictions. We need to tackle new strains uh, as we are right now, but in a different way, in, in a better way, if I may. So are you saying publicly now that Spain is not going to impose any new restrictions on travel? For the moment, no. <laughs> no, no, no. For the moment, no. And I think we are putting in place Spain, what has done, and I think we all, our colleagues here in, in Europe, we follow the same path. I mean, we are trying to give certainty to, our, to, the, to travelers. I mean, if we put a restriction, it's not to uh, let them down or, or lift them two weeks later. We've been trying to give certainty, and if this works, at least it's going to work, if nothing really risky happens again. And I think we are in a position that we can work on this path to try to improve every single day. You can pivot quickly. Yep. You can. So what's the actual vaccination level of the citizens of Spain? 75%. And in France? On en est sur les, les, les plus de 12 ans, euh, sur la cible vaccinable, on en est désormais à euh, pas loin de 90% des plus de 12 ans qui sont vaccinés. Voilà. Edmund? Well, uh, we are about 25% now. Um, the Caribbean, and I'd like to make that point, and if you allow me to perhaps just indicate a bit about the recovery in the sense of how important it is to uh, small, highly tourism dependent countries of the world where domestic tourism is a small fraction of what is required and the capacity to drive recovery through domestic tourism is very weak. The need for us therefore to have open borders and to have um, arrangements with our international markets 
that are as seamless as possible is critical. In our case in Jamaica, the recovery was all United States. In a year, we got back one million visitors, which was phenomenal, but it was all United States because the UK had been closed and Canada had been closed. And that's the experience for most of the highly dependent small tourism countries. So I wanted to make that point in the mix of what you said, Minister from Spain and, and from uh, Portugal, as well as from, um, uh, from uh, France. France. Now, because the difference between us is very stark. So, uh, to the point of vaccination, and, and that's a very key point, because therein lies the real problem of equitable recovery. Because the disparity between accessibility of small, less resourced countries that are highly tourism dependent and the bigger ones is marked. Very stark indeed. And we have to, as a tourism family, make our voices heard on this. Because we cannot have a recovery that is asymmetrical. We must make everyone have an equal chance and leave no one behind. I wanted to make that point. I got gotcha. you. And thank you. Minister Shalaby has some experience in equitable recovery. <laughs> thank you, Edmund. Minister Shalaby in, in, in Egypt has some experience in equitable recovery that predates the pandemic. There was a time that you were on the do not fly list in the United Kingdom. You were on the, on the level four of the United States. I remember being in Luxor and seeing 45 boats on the Nile going nowhere. Uh, so you've had experience trying to recover before, but nothing like this. So how do you do, as Edmund says, an equitable recovery and getting all your stakeholders involved because you can connect the dots between inbound tourism, whether it's domestic or otherwise, and these economic sustainability of your country? Well, yeah, thank you for this good question. And as we are all sharing the same um, objective of the importance of the tourism sector in, to our countries, Egypt is uh, dependent on inbound tourism break with two seas and uh, Nile with lots of uh, sceneries uh, on both banks of the Nile. Uh, tourism is uh, is a phenomenal industry that is uh, penetrating the whole country. Uh, yes, we've seen lots of crisis in tourism. None is like this one. Uh, we we've put our priorities and we understood our strengths. Uh, first, when we started uh, and we resumed tourism, we knew where we should be opening tourism, where it's going to be sustainable, and that we will not close down again. Um, uh, tourism was open into the sea, sand, and, and sun destinations at the Red Sea, South Sinai, Sharm el Sheikh, and Hergada. These are prime destinations for what was needed during COVID. People needed uh, open spaces, uh, they needed sun, and they needed to relax by the beach out of their, you know, uh, uh, compartments in their houses where they were isolated for four months. So uh, this was a key uh, thing for us and, and a key point that we wanted to uh, strength, uh, stress on. The second thing was also that these are destinations for tourism where population is not that high. It's the density of local population is not that high. Uh, so we were addressing people who are working in the industry and tourism, and we've put them as a priority for vaccination. We're now 100% vaccination, vaccinated our, our staff in these areas, and almost 90% with the residents as well. So we're uh, ready to declare that these are 100% fully vaccinated areas where, uh, you know, a, a safe environment is provided to tourists. Also allowing uh, tourists coming with a negative PCR, and if they don't have it within their countries, they would have it upon arrival. And having the procedures around that by isolating them during the required period or until the uh, negative PCR is, is provided. The beauty about these destinations is that it's providing the spacious that is required for that. So, uh, uh, you know, lots of spaces between the travelers and the sea and beach activities were provided. 
Second phase, as we're introducing more vaccination uh, around the Nile banks and, and Nile cruises, as you've mentioned, now we are vaccinating uh, our uh, Nile cruises uh, staff and the nature also for people who came to Egypt and they visited the pharaonic sites and uh, archaeological sites, they understand exactly how um, uh, this works. Uh, in, in our industry. So again, health and safety procedures is provided for travelers as well as, uh, as staff. A um, uh, key thing is vaccination, as my friend from Jamaica has, uh, has mentioned. We, the country is now manufacturing its own vaccination uh, uh, doses according to the international regulations by WHO and uh, uh, worldwide recognized vaccinations. Uh, whereby we can ensure that this is uh, available to all the locals when the international companies are not able to provide fair share of vaccination for, for people across the world. Uh, as you mentioned, rightly mentioned, that uh, fair chance for opening uh, countries and borders to people and to allow them to travel freely as they used to uh, now we're introducing, you know, passports for uh, for immigrations, health passports, and, and God only knows what else we're going to introduce uh, that will put more limitations on people's freedom. Um, we need to work collaboratively together to ensure that uh, travel uh, industry is going as slow as it was. And, and also I'd like to commend on the intelligence of the, whoever has put this panel that uh, we're all sharing the same, uh, you know, uh, background of, of a destination of the sea, sand and, and, uh, and beach uh, capabilities, whereby each destination has a unique value of the culture and other activities as well that is being um, you know adding to the to the destination uh, beauty as an, a unique attraction to tourists so it's uh, it's quite intelligent to bring this uh, panel together uh, to share the thoughts and really put together um, a way out uh, for travelers to ensure that they can enjoy uh, various destinations as they wish and as they used to have before. Thank you, Minister. M Minister Sakuraki, uh, you know, Greece sort of set the role model for me because you didn't just vaccinate the people in the cities where, where planes landed, but you went out to the islands where the ships go. And the people who had one-on-one -on -one physical contact with visitors, you really focused on that vaccination, didn't you? And, and let me just take stock of what I've heard before, uh, Peter, just for a minute, uh, for the vaccination and for the very important phrase that I heard from uh, from His Excellency, Mr. Barlett, uh, leaving no one be behind. I express, you know, again, a very high level of, of let's say, of, of being tasked by government that uh, we are donating vaccinations to a lot of vaccines to a lot of countries. Uh, just recently, a very large portion of, uh, of vaccines were sent out to Rwanda, where we send vaccines to Albania, to North Macedonia, a lot of countries that really need our help, Jordan, and we're going to continue to do so because this is a battle that we all have to we all have to give. And I'm, I'm very honored that we were able to play just you know, to play just a small part in that. Now, uh, to your question, uh, we actually implemented three phases in the vaccination of the islands. We first went to the very small islands because we have to be here for every every person who lives in the smallest island to the tallest mountain, wherever they are around Greece. So we vaccinated them and it was a very swift process. We went out to them. Then we continued to the islands that were up to 10,000 citizens. And then we went to the largest islands. That was a procedure that took about three months. Uh, the largest islands were the most difficult, let's say, to, to convince. That's why we ran very individualized campaigns. And we started sending out uh, missions to the homes of the disabled people, also to large hotels, in order to enable this vaccination process and, of course, make everyone feel safe. As they were about to receive a large number of, uh, city, of, of people, our, our guests, who would come during the summer season. So I think that really this uh, proved, you know, the very smooth cooperation of public sector and private sector. And it was a good case and a, and, and a success, let's say, story that we were able to put together and now be focused on. Um, but also taking stock of what I've heard before, and if you allow me for a minute, 
Uh, he talked about also people who travel within the country. Uh, we saw this year a very important and a very interesting character characteristic that is very harmoniously linked to sustainability. We saw a lot of people not only traveling to the typical sea and sun, beautiful destinations, uh, but also traveling around Greece in the villages, in places where they are not, not typically summer destinations. And this was also linked to their COVID concerns. They, would they wanted a destination that was safer, to their thinking at least, that was more scarcely uh, populated and they would come closer to nature. And this is also linked, as I said before, to sustainability. If you ask the people during and after the COVID, they would tell you that the future is, is green, is blue and digital. And this is something that was clearly emphasized this year, where we see the large dispersion of population, not only, as I said, to the summer destinations, the islands, but also in mainland Greece, this is something that we're going to include, of course, and incorporate in our 10-year strategy when we also face the challenges of uh, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and, of course, economic sustainability. And let's not forget that this summer also was characterized by the enormous wildfires that we also faced here in Greece. And this is also part of the equation when we talk about the future of tourism and, of course, the future of our planning when it comes also to special development. Madam Minister, thank you so much. I'm going to end with one question for all of you. I want you to promise me you're going to give me 30-second answers. All right, we have them promised? Okay. 30, 30, I said 30, 30. Yes, I got it. I, you know. <laughs> Here we go. During this last 18 months, what's the one lesson that you learned that you were able to apply that is going to go forward to sustain you? The one lesson. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Cooperation. I think cooperation is the, the, main, the main lesson that I've, that I've learned from these really difficult and tough times. I think the, in, future, in the future, the future challenges we are going to face, uh, we are going to try to, to driven them by cooperating all together. All together, all countries together, all sector, private sector and public sector, uh, the only answer to future challenges are going to, to be dealt by cooperation. Minister Chalabi. Um, I believe it's, uh, it's the regulations and, and applying the policies and procedures and also following them up, not to leave them uh, you know, to the hands of, uh, of applying only, but also uh, the follow-up from senior leadership Till the tiniest employee in the in the industry is a is a key message. The other thing is communication across the world, across the line, across the roads. You need to communicate every step of the way in order to ensure credibility is given to your travelers and to your partners as well. They need to buy into what you're doing and really believe that what you're doing is the right thing. And also, they would go back with a positive feedback on the procedures that has been applied. All right, Minister Zakaraka. Uh, you said 30 minutes, huh? 30 seconds. <laughs> so it's just 30 seconds, no worries. Um, so it's definitely international cooperation, accountability to us is a very important word. And then, of course, with that comes confidence. And these three characteristics, I think, played an important role in just, you know, building this relationship uh, of, of trust and confidence on both member states and, of course, our citizens. And thank you very much for that. I greet all my friends in Portugal. Uh, they must be sitting somewhere over there, as I judge from the text. They are. They greet you right back. Secretary Lemoyne. Yes. Je crois que cette période, elle a montré combien le secteur du tourisme... I believe that uh, this... Mais combien... Uh, Chacun des segments du tourisme était interdépendant. Uh, segment, tourist segment, is uh, very diverse, but it, it is also interdependent. And we have felt the impact upstream and downstreams when uh, thousands of restaurants close. That also has an impact on producers when activities close. Of course, there are impacts on the buses. We won't have large groups visiting cities. So we realize the importance and the weight of tourism. I was uh, talking to Julia Simpson about this from 
WTTC. We need to uh, talk to ministers about the importance of uh, tourism. Everybody realized that when tourism stops, it's not only tourism. Often it is part of a country that stops. Uh, and this is a virtue uh, of the crisis. It is easier uh, to uh, support uh, measures uh, uh, with my uh, minister, my prime minister, because now we have adopted several measures in favor of tourism. Uh, when the uh, ski resorts uh, closed, uh, we realized that we had to adopt a plan. The President of the Republic even said uh, we need to implement a, a tourism plan because uh, this showed us the importance of uh, tourism. Before all of this, uh, we thought that it was all very automatic. It's a sector, um, a private sector. Uh, we had tourists. Uh, we had uh, enormous flows, masses of tourists, but it's much more complex than that. But now we need to set up all of this. We need to structure all of this. We need to establish coordination between the private and the public se uh, sector, uh, which uh, did not always exist, but it's an enormous gain in my view. At risk. Uh, during the pandemic, it might be important to remind everybody those jobs are still at risk. Edmund. Yes, those 30 jobs. 30 seconds, Edmund. <laughs> it, those jobs are still at risk, so we learn one new word, competition. So we seek to develop together common strategies and protocols that we all can share so that we grow together and we recover together instead of competition, which says, I do it versus you. So that's the new takeaway from this recovery program. The second is resilience, the ability to bounce back, the ability to get back better and stronger, again with competition together. Thank you, Edmund. From Egypt, from Greece, Spain, France, and Jamaica, please thank our ministers.